Yay! Hi, everybody. Welcome. Hello. Welcome. Hello, Danielle. Hello, Amanda. How are you? Hi, Lynn. Good. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Hi. I'm so excited to be here. <laughs> So we want to welcome everyone out there to the uh, Los Angeles Public Library's Your Author interview with author Danielle Clayton. Um, uh, she's a New York Times bestselling young adult fiction author. And um, we want to thank Danielle for the interview today. And we also want to thank the Library Foundation of Los Angeles and the Lenore S. and Bernard A. Fund for their generous support. I'm Amanda Charles, a librarian for young adults at uh, Central Library's Teenscape Department. And my name is Lynn Nguyen. I am the Young Adult Librarian at the Chinatown Branch Library. It is my pleasure to host your author today, and I hope you will enjoy this program. Please feel free to use the chat box to communicate your thoughts, comments, and questions at any time. Uh, today, we are featuring Danielle Clayton. Yay, Danielle Yay. Uh, here is the author of uh, the Bells, which has been nominated for the 2019 Lotus Star Award, featured on the Kirkus Review's Best Books of 2018 list, and has reached the New York Times bestseller list. She is the COO of We Need Diverse Books, an organization dedicated to making sure diverse stories reach all children. Adventurous by nature, Danielle has been to five out of seven continents and plans to attend culinary school. Wow. <laughs> well, when COVID's over, if it's over, I'll do these things. <laughs> it'll be over. It'll be over. I know. <laughs> but thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited. Librarians yeah. are my favorite people. I do everything anyone, any librarian asks me to do, I do it. So I'm excited. Oh, thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you so much. It is such an honor to talk with you today. Um, so we are going to um, just kind of start with a couple of opening questions and then um, open up to questions from the people watching on Facebook uh, Live and YouTube, our YouTube channel today. Um, so uh, just a quick question to start off. When was the moment in your life when you realized that you were destined to be a writer? Well, I didn't know I was going to be a writer. I didn't want to be a writer. Um, I failed chemistry in in college and I had to figure it out. I thought I was gonna be a doctor and I had all these grand plans and then chemistry is really hard. <laughs> and when I was away for college, I'm very spoiled and so I was very stressed out about being away from home and living in a dorm and having to do all these things. <laughs> and I just started returning to the books that I loved as a young reader and trying to find the semblance of home. So like Harriet the Spy and um, A Wrinkle in Time and books I read uh, over and over again, The Phantom Tollbooth, all of Virginia Hamilton's books, Walter Dean Myers, to find that sort of peace while I was away. And I thought, oh, I'll just be a teacher then or a librarian. And I was those things. And when I was getting my master's in children's literature, trying to uh, learn more about the canon of children's books so that I could be a librarian and a teacher and really a book bully telling children what to read, saying, you must read this, <laughs> um, which I think is my true destiny. I had to take a writing class. And one of my writing professors, uh, her name is Hilary Holmesy. She made me, she raked me over the coals. She made me write all of these things and I hated it. It felt like having your teeth pulled out. I was kicking and screaming. I was like, I can't do this. I'm not a writer. I'm just here to read books and talk about them. Like that's the program that I'm in. And then she said, no, you're a writer. You can do all of those things and read books and talk about them, but you're a writer. And she made me do all of this, <laughs> all of this writing work. And I finally found my voice. And I think because I saw so many missing children from the canon of children's books when I was studying it, that I thought, hmm, how can I change that? Also, how can I give a variety of different kinds of stories? I kept seeing certain types of stories told about certain children. And I thought, why don't I get the adventure? Why don't I get to go to outer space or through the wardrobe or to, you know, get the kiss or get asked out on that date or, you know, save the world? And I thought I need to maybe I should try writing those stories. So I sort of stumbled into this. <laughs> I didn't set out wanting to be a writer. Thought I was going to be a doctor, then just then a teacher and a librarian. Um, so I don't know. I'm still working out this whole 
you're a writer artist thing. Um, I still pretty much feel like a bookworm and a nerd who just writes things. Um, so I don't know, still working out. Maybe one day I'll wake up and be like, oh, that's right. I'm an <laughs> artist. I'm a writer. That's right. <laughs> but I haven't always wanted to be. You're an amazing writer, that's for sure. If you can make it on the New York Times bestseller list, you're doing something right. And um, <laughs> I know, <laughs> and I know, like, um, you know, since you were just talking a little bit about, um, you know, the books that you do write, um, I have a, a question here. I, I know that um, the books that you've written now, like, what was it about the books that you read as a child that has, um, you know, influenced the way that you write today and your past books that you've written? I. Oh my gosh, I devoured all of the Babysitter's Club and I devoured everything fantasy. And I wanted to, and I was interested in sort of groups of girls and sort of all of the things that happens when we function in groups. And so I think reading a lot of fantasy made me fall in love with magic and creatures and all of the things that I was looking for. I was always looking for doors into other worlds and something a little bit more interesting than this human existence. I used to write letters to aliens, like waiting for them to come get me and like bring me to my true home. Um, so I was always looking for sort of mischief and magic and also trying to work out what it meant to be a girl and in groups of girls and sort of how we function um, and sort of the whys of society. So I think that all of filling my creative well as a small reader with a lot of magic and a lot of complicated um, sort of stories about the world, I think really made me sort of stew and create an alchemy of story ideas that I have for myself, wanting to sort of tangle with what cert what it means to be um, the person who I am and what magic means and how it interacts with sort of this messy world that we are in. But I'm really drawn to magic and other worlds. So I think growing up reading fantasy sort of did that to me. I wish I was a little reader again. Like when you could just read a book and just mm -hmm. love it without thinking about like, oh no, <laughs> what does this mean? <laughs> or spend all day reading. I used to hide mm -hmm. under my grandmother's table um, and just read all day. Just right under there with a pillow and a blanket. Mm -hmm. The sun would be, I'm destined to be a cat. That's why I was like, that is what I am. <laughs> Always been like, give me a little warm slice of sunlight under a table where no one's looking at me or bothering me and some snacks and a book. It's a perfect day. So quick librarian question here, just out of curiosity. Were you surprised by the number of people who, when you were a librarian, thought that all you did was read all day? Yes. And I wish that that's what it was. Um, <laughs> I thought becoming a librarian, oh, I just get to read all day. And then I was like, oh no, there's a lot of work involved. My body hurts because I'm lifting boxes of books and I have to like shelve and I have to remember the alphabet all day. And I have to um, run all of these computer softwares in order to track books. I also have to send out lots of forms. I have to pull books. I have to deal with teachers and requests and angry parents about book content and flags and books being flagged and have to call them. So it's like a lot of so much programming. Uh, bulletin boards. The bulletin boards probably drove me <laughs> nuts the most because I just wasn't, my brain, I'm just not artistic. So they always looked a little bad uh, until I got yeah. a librarian assistant. So it was, I thought I was just going to read books all day. It's yeah. so surprising to hear you say that you're not artistic. I feel like the Bells is like such a, um, a visual creation. Like I feel like it's the only book that I've read in a while that actually has a look, like it's so cinematic. That, um, and the descriptions are like so precise, like it's this con like conception of a dystopia. It's so marvelous. Um, you create such a picture on a page. How did you, not artist, <laughs> how did you come up with that? How did you envision the place? Well, thank you so much for that. Um, thank you, I so appreciate that. I am a visual writer because I can't draw. I don't feel like I have magic in my hands, but like I think uh, cinematically, and I was creating and scrapbooking a lot. I was a kid who scrapbooked. 
And so I was very um, interested in and collecting a lot of different images. So I used to live in France and Japan and I would collect magazines from um, when I lived there and images and I would scrapbook. And I just thought the beauty cultures in both of those communities were very interesting. And I just kept collecting images and as I was trying to figure things out and that's really how I sort of tool and create that cinematic um, view in my head. And I wanted to, I did it on purpose. It's definitely an exaggerated uh, way of writing. And I, I wanted to create this sort of oversaturation um, because that's how I feel the beauty industry is. So I wanted to create that mood, mostly because I, I chase Holly Black. She's sort of like my writing um, rabbit that I chase. And I, what I love about Holly Black and her books, and if you haven't read them, you you know, anyone listening, you need to come to the school of Holly Black. She creates a dark wood as a writer and she leads you as the reader into the dark wood and then she thickens the foliage around you and you can't get out. And I wanted to create a world where I lured you in with some sweets and sugar and beauty and then I trapped you in the web and you couldn't get out. Um, and it was like, that. I was trying to create that because when I see things like Marie Antoinette's Court, when I go into Sephora and beauty, um, like beauty apothecaries, especially in Japan and when I was in France, they are this weird candy coated sort of like, I get this excitement. I'm like 11 year old girl again. And I wanted to create that and then like shatter it. So I did that on purpose. Um, and it was a lot of fun to play with metaphor and color uh, and taste and senses, because I also believe that the way that um, especially female bodied people, their bodies are treated like consumable objects, like food. Um, and they are looked at and examined and talked about in that way. And I wanted to sort of mirror that uh, for the reader. So I appreciate it. I wish I could draw. I wish I could draw all that stuff. You're, you're like <laughs> metaphor, color, you're using these artistic terms. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, you really do paint a picture for your readers with your words. My um, art teacher in high school would tell you I was terrible. I barely <laughs> made it out of like art. I have no sense of like depth or <laughs> line. Um, <laughs> I can't see it very well. So I, yeah, I wish, I wish. Well, you did an amazing. <laughs> well, you did an amazing job writing it out and giving us a really beautiful visual um, as you're telling your story. Um, I have a question for you. What, so, in the, in your story of the bells, why did you choose New or Orleans or New Orleans? <laughs> okay, so yes, yeah, so I use this I Orleans or Orleans, whatever you uh -huh, want. Or, to do mm -hmm. it. There's the original city in France. And mm -hmm. then also New Orleans, which is mm -hmm. our city in America. And I wanted to blend mm -hmm. both of them and then sprinkle a little bit of Japan on there because these are places that are very important to me, um, mm -hmm. places I've lived, places that my family is connected to. And so I wanted to take this idea of um, France and the things that the French beauty industry sort of created the, indus the beauty industry around the world um, along with beauty industries in Japan and Korea. And so I wanted to, and that's what I studied. I studied the beauty industry and like, how do we get this lipstick? How was lipstick made? How did it become a thing? And it all, all roads lead back to ancient times, but also France was when we had this sort of huge economic boom in the beauty industry. So that came to, to be. And then I was very interested in blood politics and blood politics um, and, who gets what based on one's blood. And Americans are famous and love their blood, blood politics and their racial politics. And no other place in our country is that in terms of history than New Orleans. And mm. so I wanted to look at sort of what antebellum New Orleans looked like in terms of blood hierarchies and how the society was sort of demarcated. And so I just put all the things that I'm interested in into a little pot and tried to create a secondary world that sort of pulled from those different wells um, of things that I liked, but also like make it pretty. And so I think those three places are very pretty or have a beauty to them, so. Thank you. 
And so do we want to um, open it up to questions from the audience? Yeah, let's see. Um, if the audience has any questions at all, um, please do feel free to type it in the chat box and we'd be happy to ask those questions for Danielle. Um, but in the Can meantime, I ask the two of you a question too? Yeah, yes, ask us. Absolutely. Okay, so you know in the world of the bells, all of the animals are the size of teacups. And so <laughs> I must ask, I always ask, if you could have one little teacup animal right now, you can have any animal you want, but it has to be that wee little size, what animal are you gonna pick? Elephants, hands down, elephants. Like, I already had answered this question like on like page 20 of the bells. I'm like, <laughs> elephants, I want a teacup elephant. Like, can I know you there's dragons, like there's yeah. teacup dragons and I'm like, why don't I want a dragon? But no, just the teacup elephant just seemed like the most decadent, like wonderful, like adorable thing ever. So yeah. Elephant. And it would be like this big. I know. So it would like, it like <laughs> but they'd be all like, you know, it would be like, <laughs> and that little trunk would just be like a little, yeah, be so cute. I don't know why the first animal I thought of was owl. So, oh, so cute! It'd be like yeah, this thing. little owl. Be like, I like Hoo. little owls. Mm -hmm. I love owls. <laughs> and it'd be a, such a tiny little hoot. Yeah, hoot. it would be hoot. <laughs> hoot. <laughs> That's good. But they have the good. temperament of the larger animal in the smaller animal, right? Like a teacup mm -hmm. bear could still be a dangerous thing. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, yeah. That's right. So you have to be careful. And I put a pack of teacup wolves. Mm -hmm. um, into the second book for Holly Black because I asked her, I said, so what do you want? She was like, I want a wolf, but you can't just have one wolf. They have to be sold in a pack because they need <laughs> friends. I said, I got you. I got you, Holly. Anything for you. That's good. I agree with your picks. Good job. <laughs> we have a few questions coming in. Okay. Yeah. Uh, we have a question from Dodo Pink here. Uh, Dota Pink asked, when will Bells 3 be released? Oh my God. Well, <laughs> yes. Kind of a secret because a secret? I probably wasn't okay. supposed to say that there is a third book, but there is a third <gasps> book and I'm working on it because I have another bigger surprise mm -hmm. come alongside it. So it's coming. It's coming. It's coming. It's coming. COVID okay. has thrown lots of things upside down in terms mm -hmm. of publishing schedules but I promise you it's coming and I think you'll enjoy it. Oh, we're so excited and can't wait. Thank oh, you, Dodo, for your I'm question. So about this other big mystery announcement. Uh, I so know. We have, <laughs> we have a question from Brioni Nuosu. Um, did you follow the same process for the Marvelers? Okay, so this is my first time ever talking about this book. So I just announced this week, what is time? Um, that I have a middle grade uh, fantasy series called The Marvelers coming out in winter 2022. And I pitch it as my answer to Harry Potter. It's the UN of magic schools um, in the sky. And it's just about a little girl. And it is, and her, she comes from a group of people who are also magical. However, they are ostracized in the magical community. And it's about her being the first of her kind going to this huge institute in the sky and her sort of all the things that she battles. And so I followed a process of, I wanted to, I, all of my books start with a central question. And the question usually is something that makes me upset. And I was trying to grapple with sort of in this US context and across the world, why don't we want to go to school with each other? right? Why is school a battleground for people? Um, why do we always want to clump and segregate and move? And I live in New York City, and New York City still has segregated schools in the year 2020. So I was wrestling with that and being frustrated with that because I was a teacher and a librarian in East Harlem, New York, where all of my students looked a particular way. And I would tutor students 20 blocks away on the upper East side who went to school with zero children who looked like the children in my school. And I thought, how is this happening? And so it, at its heart, it's really a commentary on school segregation. Um, and yeah, so I start with something that makes me angry and then I spool it out 
Um, and I was a little bit frustrated with uh, the Potterverse and she who shall not be named and all of the things going on um, in her world and this idea of retcon diversity and what happens when you are an afterthought, when what happens when you go to a school, um, Hogwarts is a place that I believe you do colonial magic where mm -hmm. I have to learn your way. What happens when you come from a magical household and a lot of children of color um, come from places that have magic already. And if I were to go to Hogwarts, I wouldn't be able to practice that. I would have to practice that way. Um, so I wanted to write something else. <laughs> so um, I'm super excited to share it with the world and get everyone excited to marvel. And that just means your marvel is something that's marvelous about you, which is your magic. And it comes from your, um, your family and from where you're from. So I'm super excited. That sounds amazing. Yay! I can't wait to do that. That's going to be fun. I, I could go back in time and give it to myself when I was in middle school and then read it then too. Yes. <laughs> yes. I wrote the book that I wanted to read at, at 10, honestly, mm -hmm. and 11. Like just that big world. Because I missed Harry. I was much older. Um, mm -hmm. I was getting my master's in children's literature when it was coming out. So I was like, oh, mm -hmm. let me read that. I had to read it. So, and I was like, this is wonderful. And she did a lot of wonderful things. But now I think it's time for us to to move on um, and and remember how wonderful it was and usher mm -hmm. in the next generation of storytellers that have something to say for the children mm -hmm. now as well. Which that is hard. I agree. No, it's we agree. We got to move on. <laughs> we have, times have changed. And, you know, that's that's probably like 10, 20 years ago. I remember I read that when I was in high school. So and we got to move it. on. And yeah. I loved it. But we can also sort of love things and we can mm -hmm. leave them and mm -hmm. move forward and make space for other things for the next Absolutely. generation of readers. Absolutely. Well, we have a question here from A.N. Um, okay. She or he asked, what do you enjoy about being an author? What are the pros and cons? Oh, boy. Can we start mm -hmm. with the cons, though? Because yeah, I'm let's the go cons ahead. Right now. Yeah, please. Um, the cons are it always feels like you're putting your heart in a mm -hmm. book um, and a piece of you in a story in a book. And there are so many people that love it and that will be obsessed. And then there are people who hate it. And that is sort of what it means to be, to write something and to put it out there for people. So it's this constant like, you know, oh, I love it. Oh, this was terrible. Oh, I loved it, loved it. Oh, this was terrible. And so um, you just have to get used to the ups and downs and the highs and lows. Uh, I think also it can be just really hard to keep on a really, to be healthy as a writer and an author because it's sort of an endless gig, you got to write and you got to keep going and writing is rewriting. And that means doing it over and over again. One of my editors sent me another edit letter and I was like, this is draft number six. When is this over? <laughs> this is endless. And so you have to just settle up for, for that. I think one of the best parts though of being a writer is that I get to make up very cool things for a living and I get to be in the service of children. I get to actually try to make something where they feel validated and seen and where they just, the role of a storyteller I think is to entertain and I get to do that. And children are very um, wise and astute and they will let you know when they like something and when they don't. And I just think that it's an honor and a privilege to be able to write for them and to be able to give them something that they can think about and enjoy um, and be excited about, especially when we are dealing with all the things we're dealing with, a book can be such a powerful thing. Um, and I think the other thing is author friends. I love being with other author friends and librarian friends and teacher friends uh, because book people are the best people. We're like nerds who like stories and we can argue about magic and, you know, pacing and characterization. And, you know, if I was a, a accountant, I'd be arguing about numbers. And that just feels like really boring to me. So, so yeah. Cool. Um, we have uh, another question um, from uh, Kelsey Soderstrom. Okay. Um, and uh, Kelsey says, I know Danielle already mentioned a few titles, but are there any books that were particularly influential on her as a teen? And also, what is she reading right now? Ah, I think influential as a teen, um, I was, 
once you get to high school, it's when all the like boring, I call boring because it's literature with the capital L starts being thrown at you. So I was trying to escape to kill a mockingbird and like all of the sad, like, oh, stuff. And I was reading, I was reading Anne Rice and I was reading, um, you know, I was actually reading romance and things like that were stuff that I could just voraciously just plow through um and enjoy myself without all of all of that those things so yeah in high school and as a teen i was reading stephen king and ann rice and um things that were purely for me escapist and that's no shade those are books that i write that's what i want to write but away from all of the stuff that my teacher was trying to get us to like to think about um what i'm reading right now i'm actually uh finishing the uh a I guess it's the Book of Shadows trilogy, a Book of Souls trilogy, which is, um, it starts with the discovery of witches. So I've been reading some adult books, which blasphemy, right? Um, and I just finished my friend's trilogy, Victoria Schwab's uh, Darker Shade of Magic. So finished that. And I'm listening to Lovecraft Country so that I can get ready for the TV show, which is very exciting. But uh, the last book, the book that I'm finishing is called The Midnight Lie by Marie Rakowski. Uh, which is really, really, really good. Um, and I'm preparing to read uh, The uh, Wayward Witch by Zoraida Cordova, which is um, Latinx fairies. So I'm already always ready uh, for fun creatures. So I think that's, yeah, I think that's my rundown without having to look at my Audible and my Kindle. Wow, I'm working it's on. a long list. <laughs> I know. I try, I, I well, actually I, read and listen to a lot of things it. at the same time. I love it. Um, where does your inspiration come from? For for I mean, you obviously read so much, but um, like when you're writing your own piece, how do you put everything together? I think um, all of my worlds start with a seed of something that bothers me. So it usually comes from things that I, my 16 year old self, if I'm writing YA, were, was preoccupied with. I can look at some of my journals and look back and say, why was I obsessed with that? And, you know, the bells came out of this obsession of why, why are people treated differently because they are perceived as beautiful? And what does being perceived as beautiful mean? Um, I was a kid that had a lot of acne um, I'm an adult that wrestles with that. And it's something that I think about a lot. Why the way that our bodies sort of behave, dictate how people treat us or whether we're perceived as being having value. And so I start there and then I'm inspired by a lot of aesthetics things. So um, obviously the bells, I watched Sofia Coppola's uh, Marie Antoinette and I thought, wow, this is interesting. I've been watching a lot of documentaries on her. So a lot of it comes from nonfiction and my interests there and um, trying to pull all of those things together in sort of a fantasy tangle. Um, and, but it always starts with something that bothers me. So maybe it's like a therapeutic thing, the writing, just like a little grumpy girl. I've always been that way. Just like my childhood photos, which I'm blocking with my head because they're right behind me. I, was gonna like, say, I, <laughs> I know there's like my parents and my like oh, I photo. That. Oh my goodness. That's awesome. That is, like the eighties Afro, like. Are you an only there. child? No, I have a brother, oh, you have a brother. but I should be. <laughs> you should. <laughs> I always feel that way as a firstborn, you know? I'm like, you got it right the first time. Why did we have to try again? Like, <laughs> we know who's <laughs> in charge here. <laughs> I'm such a troll. So spoiled. Troll, spoiled. Yeah. And I'm not even 5'2". So definitely the troll part is like, right. I'm like a little, little troll. The troll doll. <laughs> Um, we have a couple more few more questions Amazing. from the audience um, that popped up. Uh, I'm going to skip down a little bit because I am really fascinated by this question, and we're going to come back to the one above it. But um, if you don't like something that you've written, do you start over? This is from Kelly Wilson. Do you start over or find a way to make the story something you're excited to read? Well, I truly, my first drafts, I believe, have been written by, like, Oscar the Grouch, who lives in a trash can, because they're so bad. Um, and I'm so grumpy and they're so awful that I just write the trashy thing 
and then I put it to the side and I start over again. I never throw it out because I'm like, oh no, I need it. I feel like it's like my little blanket of safety, but um, I hate everything that I write until I don't hate it anymore because I keep writing on top of it or rewriting it or moving things around or printing it out and handwriting or writing in a notebook and recopying and retooling the thing that I've written. And so I don't believe that there is wasted words or wasted time. I think that even if you don't like something you've written right now, you can repurpose it and recycle it and find the piece that works and rewrite it. And so everything that I, it took me eight books to break through with my first debut, which is Tiny Pretty Things. Um, and all of those eight books that came before that were messy and didn't have the thing that they needed to make them a compelling and entertaining story, they weren't wasted words. And a lot of them I didn't like and I don't like when I go back to them, but I pluck out certain things and I try to remix them because I don't think that anything is wasted. So I just, I'm stubborn and I just keep trying over and over and over again um, until I like it. How many drafts do you usually do for, um, for something that you publish? Um, usually about five. Um, my first draft is awful. Um, it's always awful. Thank God my editors are nice and kind. It's my exploratory, like, oh no, I don't know what I'm doing. My pants are on fire uh, draft. Then my second one is let me figure out structure and plot. Let me move things around, make an actual map, clean up the arc. Then my third one is character. Let me figure out what the heck my character wants because that's important. <laughs> and let me make sure that I flesh things out and that the plot and the character go together. And then my last one is sort of the um, making sure that the world is consistent and that the emotional tissue is there. The why do we care? Um, why is this person's journey somewhat something to watch and to bear witness to? So it takes me about five drafts to really cook um, and get something good. And I wish I could do it better the first time around, but I'm finding that it just, my brain, the way the story comes out of me, it doesn't come out clean. It comes out messy and then I fix it. It makes me a little bit slower than other writers. I think exactly. as long as you follow your passion and you do what you love, like you just keep going no matter how long it takes. <laughs> I know, but like this is supposed yeah. to get easier with it's each book. Easy. Oh my goodness. You know, it I, gets harder. I have a really good question down here from uh, Brianni. Uh, she asks, when did you give yourself permission to be a writer? I think I was 26. Um, and that's when I was in my master's program, mm -hmm. getting, um, just trying to be a, a little librarian. <laughs> um, is, and I got bullied. I got bullied into this. And I said to myself, okay, maybe my teacher, maybe my professor is right. Maybe there is something here and maybe I'm just afraid. Um, and I said, I will just try to write some things, but I don't have to worry about getting published. I'll just see if I can finish something. She made me write a lot of first starts, first chapters of a lot of different things so that I was armed with stories to, to keep going on. And then I said, okay, let me just keep going. So I just kept saying yes at each level, at each process. I'll say, yes, I'll write the book. Yes, I'll edit it. Yes, I'll join a critique group and get feedback. Yes, I will maybe go to a conference and meet other writers. And I just kept saying yes. And so I mm -hmm. think for me being that permission came in slow steps because my childhood nickname is Chicken Little. I'm just a scaredy cat. And so I was always that person that I'm still scared that the sky is gonna fall, right? So I need, I'm not a person that jumps into the pool and put the toe mm -hmm. in, the foot, the ankle, the leg, and then like, ooh, ooh, splash myself with water. Um, and so I think that's how I gave myself permission to be a writer. I eased into the water slowly mm -hmm. because I was scared. You receive mm -hmm. programming growing up in certain households mm -hmm. that this isn't a viable career. You get a real job. And I had four jobs until I was, I could be a full-time writer. Um, and I still have four jobs, <laughs> but it's just a different <laughs> kind, just a different kinds I, of jobs now. You know, talking about jobs i know you're running a lot of different um 
organizations right now. Um, one of them, I want to talk a little bit about um, We Need Diverse Books. Um, sure. Can you tell us about that and, you know, why people should, you know, go to that website, go to your website and, and learn more about the different titles that you're suggesting to everybody? Absolutely. So We Need Diverse Books um, it came out of a rallying cry that one of my good friends, Ellen O, had in 2014. She uh, saw a poster at uh, for an advertising at BEA, which is Book Expo of America, which is one of the publishing industry's biggest events, right? It's where all the publishers come together and advertise all of the books that they're going to have out. And she saw a poster, she's a writer, that said children's luminaries. And it had all of the top children's book authors um, in America. And it was all white people and a grumpy cat. And Ellen O is Korean American and she's also feisty. And she got mad and she said, wait a second, why is the only diversity on this poster a cat? Um, and what she did was she came around and she went to a bunch of author friends and she said, hey, I'm really upset about this. What is going on? We really need to have a conversation with our industry about why they're not being inclusive. And so she reached out to librarians and teachers and parents and, and authors like myself and said, please share online. Why do you think we need diverse books? And so we just said, hashtag, we need diverse books. And we put the reasons why. And it went viral for several days. And then she said, oh, no. OK, well, it's time to get to work. And then we we started an organization, a nonprofit, to make sure that every kid knew that they deserved to be the hero of their own story. And we developed programming that would address this issue, which is a systemic issue, from many different vantage points to help librarians and teachers, to help parents, to help publishers, and to help writers. And so we made various programming in order to make these numbers rise and make sure that every kid gets to see themselves and that other kids get to see their neighbors and families and people who don't look like them and know that everyone deserves to be the hero of a story. And it's been the thrill of a lifetime to be able to, to do this work. I was a librarian for many years and my population of students, there wasn't much to read that reflected them. And if it was, it pressed down on the bruises of their community. So when mm. I was giving books to my black and my African students, it was mostly about civil rights and slavery, which are great. We need those books. We also need books about magic and about love. My population was over 75% from the Latinx diaspora. All of the stories had to deal with immigration. And I just had a bunch of little sixth grade girls who wanted to read about witches <laughs> and vampires. And I had nothing for them at that time. Not a single book, not a single witch who spoke Spanish. And so I was mad and I felt like we were doing a disservice to those readers. If we ask children to have a relationship with books and to read for us, it is on us to make sure that they have fun things to read that affirm them and that make them feel special and important and like they can save the world. So that's why I got involved with the organization and what we do, we do a lot of different kinds of things, types of programming, just to help the industry move along and make sure that we are serving the needs of children and give them good things, fun things to read. That's the short story. Oh, thank you. Yes. Yeah. 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 We're so happy. Yay! Um, yeah. Book cover anthology coming out, right? Yes, we do. So excited. Do you want me to talk about it? Tell us about it. Yes. Yeah. Yes, okay. Please. We need diverse books. Also, one of the big things we do is we have a relationship with Penguin Random House and Phoebe Yeh, who's a wonderful editor. She was Walter D. Meyer's editor for many years. And we decided to do anthologies so that we could help teachers and librarians have books of short stories to that that um, have diverse characters in them that are light, that are fun and that you could use in the classroom, use for read alouds, use to get your reluctant readers excited because short stories are a great way to get the kid who's like, I don't wanna read a whole book into something fun, right? And so our first one was Flying Lessons and it was for middle grade and it's done really, really well and it's super cool and has people like Kwame Alexander um, and Soman Chainani who wrote School for Good and Evil um, and Meg Medina and all of these amazing people in it. 
Then our second one is for YA and it was called Fresh Ink. And it has, again, amazing people at Jason Reynolds in it that the whole ink collection is named after his story. And then our third one was also a middle grade one, another one called The Hero Next Door. And it gives stories about like how everyone can be a hero. And then mine is lucky number four and it's called A Universe of Wishes and it's a sci-fi fantasy anthology. And it takes us to um, to outer space, to, you know what I mean, to magical worlds, to fairy tales all over. And I basically collected all of my favorite friends um, and a lot of awesome people and had them write the stories that they wish they got to see when they were young readers as fantasy and sci-fi fantasy readers. And I also got a couple of people whose worlds I love to write within their worlds. So Lib Libba Bray has returned to her Gemma Doyle world. Uh, Victoria Schwab is writing out of her Darker Shade of Magic world. Zoraida Cordova is giving me, gave me a Brooklyn Bruja uh, story. And so I was able to, you know, to boss around some really cool people and get some fun stories that are super magical. So I'm so proud and it's coming in January. So I can't wait for, for everyone to, to read it. We are looking forward to it. <laughs> yes. Yay. Yay. So, and the cover is really fun. So I'll, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll tap back into uh, these questions here that we have coming in from our audience. Um, An here asks, what advice do you have for young writers? Oh, this is a good one. Um, I have a lot of mm -hmm. advice. Uh, my first thing um, is read everything that you can read widely. I think what has helped me the most is making sure that I'm filling my creative well with lots of different kinds of stories. So even when you say you don't like something, give it a try. So reading romance really helped me understand how characters can form connections, right? Um, and learning how physical cues can do just as much as dialogue um, and plot to create tension, which is what you need in a story. Reading nonfiction gets me all of these little tidbits. Um, for example, in The Bells, I created a separate currency. So you have regular money that you use to buy food and clothing, but then you also have another currency that you use for your beauty work. And I found that out because I was just reading a book about ancient Greece and I saw that they had a separate form of currency that they used in brothels actually. And so if you went to a brothel, you had to bring a special coin. And I thought, this is interesting. That's the way the writer's mind works, right? Let me cobble, let me just grab and hoard all these little tidbits to use later. So read lots of different things because you never know what you're going to need in your writer toolbox. Um, and then I would also say to turn, try to turn your inner critic off. Uh, just write the story and see what happens and then go back. You can always fix something. If I had known that uh, as a young writer or as a younger writer at the start of my career, I wouldn't sp have spent so much time trying to be perfect. It will become as perfect as it's supposed to be after you start working in the process, but you can't perfect or a blank page. So you gotta write something. And so you just gotta get it out. Um, and so that would be my second piece. And my last piece um, would be to make friends who love stories and books because that has filled my well so much um, from just someone who will geek out with you about the thing that you love that is, you know, for me, it was finding like people who love like Outlander. So I could just talk about all of the stuff, right? It sounds ridiculous, but it is so much fun to find your group of people who will talk to you about Avatar The Last Airbender and all the story and the magic and all the different political, you know, things going on or Outlander, which is my thing. Um, I have a lot of different things that I'm really into. And I think once you find your crew of nerds, <laughs> it will make the writing uh, better and feel safer. That's great advice. <laughs> <laughs> and I hope that answers your question and take this advice and run with it. Read everything. <laughs> Visit your librarians, let them stack, give you a stack. Yeah. Yeah. I was Matilda as a kid. I'm still Matilda. Yeah. The librarians are like, oh God, you again. I'm like, yep. Oh. <laughs> I'm back. You, talking, yeah. talking about advice, um, Juliet here asked, um, what advice do you have for teachers? Any words you oh. wish your teachers would have said to you in school that were never said? 
I think I, what I wish my teachers would have done is give me um, more range to read the things that I wanted to read versus the things that they thought were important. So allowing me to read graphic novels and not calling them candy or not real books um, so that I could take in visual storytelling earlier and understand how important that sort of pictorial image is in the brain and how it helps actually stimulate like your writing. I think also um, giving, allowing me to be creative, um, write more creatively with papers and essays. Uh, I know that we have to learn a standard form, but I think being allowed to incorporate the scrapbooking that I liked and sort of the other visual elements as a visual learner would have been helpful in becoming and finding my voice as a writer and giving me things that didn't press on the bruises of Black America as the only things that I was supposed to read and fill my well with, um, doing the work as a teacher to make sure that you understand the entire kid in the community versus the things you just read on TV or in the news. So yes, it's important for me to have a foundation in that, but also if I'm only filling my well with the tragedy and the sadness, how can I find the joy? Um, and I think it's very important to create conscious um, and balanced uh, reading lists for kids uh, and making sure that you're interrogating your choices because you get to choose it. There's no reason why in my educational tenure, as overly educated as I am, that I should have been forced to read To Kill a Mockingbird four times and only get to read Zora Neale Hurston once. There's something wrong. Um, and something I think we need to do a better job at doing the work that we need to do because we owe it um, to all the people that we're teaching. That's I my agree. grumpy. I, I, agree I don't more. like that book. Mm -hmm. I always get so much hate mail. I, I hate that book. Sorry. No. Totally agree. Mm -hmm. I totally agree with you. Um, mm -hmm. we, we, you know, we have the classic list that we hand those out. Um, and it would, I would just love for more kids to come in and ask for the Reniel Hurston. This would make me so happy. Wouldn't it be mm -hmm. great? Um, It'd be so yeah. wonderful. But the Kill a Mockingbird still wins. Yeah. And mm -hmm. I would love to be able to not live in Japan and go into an English bookstore. And then that is the book that is the American face out American experience book that that's it. It's like wow. the one that we have packaged and sent around the world as the definitive American experience, which takes an image of my group of people, my lived experience. My family is from Mississippi and Alabama takes that. And that is the story. That's the only story. A single story. So I'm a little bit tired of that. So I get so much hate mail about my dislike of To Kill a Mockingbird that it's almost laughable. I should start scrapbooking it and like saving it forever. You you um, have read uh, your like negative reviews on your uh, on your podcast Deadline City <laughs> that you do with um, author Zoraida Cordova. <laughs> You are, you are brave, um, so I, I think you might make the scrapbook. Can you tell us a little bit about um, Deadline City and what it's like to talk to all of authors? Sure. So I run an obnoxious podcast called Deadline City with one of my best friends, Zoraida Cordova. Um, we are equally obnoxious, and all we do is argue on that podcast about all things writing and the writing life. And we did, I was watching some episode, I don't know who does it, but Mean Tweets. And I thought, Zoraida, we should do mean tweets, the author edition, but like, but like one star reviews that are ridiculous. And so we each spent like a day looking through each other's one star reviews and pulling out like really good gems, like that are just like so great. And then we didn't tell each other what we picked. And then we started the podcast and then we read to each other, <laughs> each other's one star reviews and sort of talked about them. One of them for her was like that she um, supports animal sacrifice because she wrote a book about witches where an animal dies in the process of a spell. And so she should be banned because of that. That was one of the reviews that said that, that she was satanic. Um, and I just, I tease her about it all the time now. Uh, but 
it's a lot of fun. And I think what it did for us too, was it pulls the bandaid off. If you are a writer and a writer that's putting out a lot of books, you are going to get bad reviews and that's okay. Every book has its reader. And I learned that as a librarian by seeing kids decide what worked for them and what didn't. And I realized that it wasn't personal and it's every book has its reader and you will find your little crew. And there are always little crews of people who are like, I love it. And they just go for it. Like, we see that with Midnight Sun right now in the Twilight book. I had to block that whole word on my social media because I just could, it's not my It's not my jam, but it's so many people's jam and I don't like to yuck anyone's yum. Um, and you have, your, you have your group. So on Deadline City, we do a lot of things like that, just shenanigans where we argue about <laughs> writing and what it's like to sort of deal with a lot of deadlines and have to um, wrestle stories and feel like, you're writing into a void. So if you want to hear us fuss, we do fuss and laugh and cry and go back and forth and argue with our guests. So we have guests on that we just argue with them the entire time. If you want a taste, you should listen to the one with Jason Reynolds because all we did was trollop him the <laughs> entire time. He, he couldn't get a word in. <laughs> I, I wanted to ask, you are friends with Jason Reynolds, but you described him as your nemesis. I know, it's fake. Oh my. Um, <laughs> I just do that because he is always giving me grief. So I feel like he's always complaining or always grumpy or we're always arguing about something because we approach story completely differently. We approach everything completely differently. So I just call him that. And um, he's like, you're not my nemesis. And I'm like, well, this is fun. Fun and games. If we were both 10, I would hate you and you would hate me. <laughs> and you, I would le you'd leave gum on my desk and I would like knock your pencils off. I said, so let's just, <laughs> it just is what it is. But he's truly one of my best friends. So it's just a fun game to play. That, that podcast episode is great. And also every one of your podcasts comes with a list of the, the books and the uh, concepts that are mentioned in the podcast. And I think the list for that one was very long. Yes, we kept him on for two hours because he kept arguing with us. It's basically, it was contemporary versus fantasy. It was sort of his way, we were throwing down because he's a hater. And just so, if people who are asking about the Marvelers, the Marvelers is dedicated to him. And in it, I am trolling him so hard because he hates dragons. And the dedication is literally to Jason Reynolds who hates dragons. Beloved readers, please ask him why. Because I wanted to arm a nation of children to go to every one of his events and ask him to explain why he hates dragons. So we're gonna make this book blow up. So that forever, forever, they we, ask him we that. <laughs> Well, you know, we're hoping to bring Jason onto our channel one of these okay. days. So uh, maybe we can I'll get I'll tell him that he should do it. I'll tell him we that will, he should do it. Yeah, yeah and him. we will ask him why he hates dragons. Please, oh, he'll laugh. He'll be like, oh no, you talked to Danielle. Oh no, yes, please do, please do ask him oh, that question. Goodness. And he has, I'm not saying that he's not wrong. He's not wrong, but I think he's, he's prejudiced against <laughs> dragons. He has some bigotry in his heart um, against them. So let him explain. I'll let him speak for himself, but you should ask that question. Oh, he'll hate it, and I would love it. <laughs> I'm putting in my notes right now. So we mm -hmm. had um, one question that we skipped about the Marvelers. Um, and since okay. you mentioned mm -hmm. it, I wanted to pop back to that question, which is um, uh, Dodo Pink asked if the Marvelers is a standalone or if it is a series, and if so, how many books do you plan to write in this world? It is a series, and we're figuring out that right now, how many books it will be, but there are multiple books. I'll just say that. You can't enter a flying magical school and have one book. I mean, you could, but why do we do that? <laughs> Dodo, I hope you're as excited as all of us. We can't wait to see uh, what you have in store for us. Yay, um, I can't wait until yay. it starts floating around soon. Oh my goodness. Um, could you tell us a little bit about what is Cake Literary? Okay, so Cake Literary is an idea kitchen. Um, and it is a packaging company, which just means that we come up with ideas and we hire writers and enter into a profit share for them to write them. When I was coming into the industry, I also saw that it was a lot of one of the secrets of children's books, which it's not really a secret, but a lot of there's a lot of um, books that are written under pen names by groups of people. 
Babysitter's Club, Gossip Girl, Pretty Little Liars, Vampire Diaries, go on, we can go on, right? There's a lot of them because these books, a lot of them, Magic Treehouse, come out really fast and very quickly. So teams of writers come up with them um, or teams of uh, creators and hire writers to write them. And so I saw that this part of the industry wasn't very diverse and that a lot of writers from marginalized backgrounds were having trouble breaking in. And I was what, working for a literary agent when I first moved to New York and I saw that he was working in the packaging world, putting together ideas, hiring writers to write them and helping them sort of enter publishing. And I thought, what if we did this for diversity? And also I wasn't seeing the type of stories that I wanted to see being told. And so the first book that I uh, came up with and that I published, Tiny Pretty Things, with my writing partner, Sona Cherapatra, is actually represents um, our company, Cake Literary, where we believe that making a book is like making a cake. And if cake had to come in one flavor for our whole lives, it would be really, really boring. And so we look at diversity sort of like it's a, like it's different kinds of cake with different kinds of frosting and ingredients. And we wanted to show that a book could have diversity and still be a page turning mystery, still be a big science fiction fantasy world. The characters just come from certain backgrounds and that influences how they move through the world. But it's not about the pain that is surrounding what they, what they are, or who they are. So the first series is Tiny Pretty Things. It also premieres on Netflix as a Netflix original series very soon. I'll be able to share the date. Um, it's coming up in a couple of weeks. Um, and it's like Pretty Little Liars, but set in a ballet boarding school where three girls are willing to do whatever it takes to be the best. It follows three girls from three different backgrounds, but it's still just a story about ballet. Um, they just happen to come from various backgrounds that influence how they move through the ballet world. But it isn't about, oh, it's sad to be brown or it's sad to be Asian American. It is about ballet. And we wanted to sort of show that you can have a story like that and it be fun. So that's a short story. That's awesome. Well, and for everybody out there, definitely check out Cake Literary if you're, you know, looking to be an inspired writer. <laughs> You'll get some help. Um, and I, I know you have another organization that we're running out of time. Oh, no. um, there's this, uh, what is Black Girls with Magic and Books? Tell oh, us a little yay. bit about that. Well, during uh, quarantine, I was very sad, like everyone else. Um, and I was missing events and I was missing sort of interacting and being able to nerd out about the things I love, which are science fiction and fantasy. And also I was seeing a lot of book clubs and I felt like, I sometimes feel like, and it goes back to the dragons thing, that science fiction and fantasy writers get sort of poo-pooed on um, as, you know, that genre, just like romance. It's like, oh, that's not literature with the capital L and it's like lowbrow fiction. And I thought, a lot goes into writing these books. It's really hard to, to create magic and make it believable and have someone want to live in your world. And so I wanted to create a book club and hopefully it'll turn into even bigger things, but because of COVID, I can't do the meetups that I wanted to do because I wanted to do a retreat and I wanted to do a tour and do all of these things where I wanted to celebrate black um, women and non-binary uh, creators of science fiction and fantasy that were sort of left out of the book club circuit. The book club circuit does all of the sort of sometimes the literary highbrow or super commercial books and the fantasy never gets picked. So I wanted to always pick the fantasy and give a shout out to these books. And also I was seeing so many great fantasy books written by black women and non-binary people that were just getting no press and not talked about. Uh, and it's hard to debut during a panic uh, pandemic. So I wanted to sort of do my part to help and just be able to talk about magic and nerdy stuff uh, like world building and are there trolls in your world or do we like vampires or werewolves and like just really have a community where I could do all of that stuff, but through the lens of what does it mean to um, come from the black community and also want to talk about magic and monsters and all of these things, which are seen as sort of nerdy. So I launched this thing because I don't have a thousand things to do, but like this is my little love bug and it's been just a lot of fun. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. Oh, Amanda, do you have any last questions? I know uh, I, Time went by so quickly and I just 
I, I still want to. I still want to play this or that with you eventually. Okay. okay. <laughs> but Amanda, do you have, do you have any other questions? I, I will. I will see any other questions I have for this or that because it's one of my favorites. So. Okay. Well then, I will uh, play with you, and you just answer it on the fly, real quick. Okay, Danielle. And okay. You don't have to think about it too much. So I'm stress. Uh, are you ready? It's gonna go by real quick. Okay. This is gonna be for our audience to enjoy as well. All right. So this or that. Cats or dogs? Cats. Oh, yeah, cats. Because I'm a cat. But I'm Cro allergic. Cronuts or cupcakes? Cupcakes, no frosting upside down. <laughs> That's how I eat my cupcakes. Red velvet or chocolate? Red velvet, always. always. Mountains or beach? Oh. <laughs> Because I've been in quarantine and away from mm -hmm. the sun, I'm going to say beach, but I'm usually okay. a mountain girl because I don't like sand in areas, all the areas and hair. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Korea or Japan? That's evil. That, <gasps> that is evil. Korean skincare and Korean barbecue, but ramen and... I refuse. <laughs> okay, Both. you refuse. Both. Both. I live okay. in Japan, but I, Eleanor would murder me, and Jenny Han would murder me and be like Korea forever. <laughs> but then, <laughs> nope. Okay, nope. we're, we're going to back out from that one then. Uh, ebooks or audiobooks? Uh, audiobooks. Okay. Libraries or museums? Libraries all day, every day. Museums, New whatever. <laughs> whatever museums. Uh, New York or Los Angeles? New York always. Oh, Sorry. Okay. LA has so much sunshine and I'm a little bit more grumpy. So I need the, I need the rain and like weirdos. And okay. LA has some weirdos, but New York has the weirdos. Okay. So. All yeah. right. If you, if you want the weirdos, you go to New York. Got it. Yeah. We have a naked cowboy. Where's your naked cowboy? <laughs> we have a naked cowboy. We don't have that. We we don't have a naked cowboy. We, ha we yeah. have naked people, but not naked cowboys. Got it. It's a difference. He's got a guitar. <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. I just have a few more. Um, <laughs> how about this? Uh, fantasy or science fiction? Fantasy, I don't, sci-fi, I don't understand time travel. I don't understand that math, the maths <laughs> for science fiction. <laughs> so fantasy, all day. I'm Lord of the this. <laughs> Lord of the Rings or Harry Potter? Oh, you're real mean. You're very oh, mean. I'm a, I'm a because really if I choose person. Harry, that means I have to deal with she who shall not be named. Oh. But then Tolkien, they're like all the brown people are orcs. So let's just say we erase she who okay. shall not be named and I'll go okay. to Hogwarts. I'll go to, okay. yeah. Okay. Okay. Cause I don't want to be all a right. troll. Okay. I don't be a troll. <laughs> orc, uh, yeah. How about this one? Holly Black or Jason Reynolds? <laughs> <laughs> so mean. I need them both. I need them both. Okay. I need them both. Yeah, they're like my two of my little lifelines, and I'm not trying to get fried by Holly because she'll kill me in one of her books. So I'm gonna oh. take both of them. Okay, we'll let you take both of them. And um, I'm just gonna ask one last question. Um, you know, being that you are you love culinary and you wanted to go to culinary school, what is your favorite dish to make? Um, my favorite dish to make would probably be. Uh, fried chicken and like Southern fried chicken okay. and cornbread. And my mom makes something sort of, it's like ca called fried corn, but it's not, you take the corn off the cob and you saute it with like bacon because everything makes it better. Um, and sugar and salt and pepper. And you can put wow. slices of tomato or okra in it. And it is in a cast iron skillet. It is perfect. That's I'm not like a country, country amazing. Girl. I'm like a country girl, like farm type stuff, like Mississippi, you know, that kind of thing. So I like simple food. So I would make simple peasant food because that's what I am. 
<laughs> I went to France and I was like, get me out of here. I can't handle all this foam and this cream. Like I can't handle it. <laughs> you sent me to Scotland. I was meat on a board and some Whoa. potatoes. So well, thank you so so much for being here with us today. Yeah. You know, we we absolutely love you and um, you know, would love to have you come back again in the near future and definitely talk to your homie Jason, tell him to I come will. through, you know. Well, you gotta help him on those this or that because he doesn't know a lot of that stuff. So. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna make sure we well I'll make I'll, I'll prepare a really good list for him. Yeah, he has so many of these. It's amazing. That list is, is so awesome. Um, I love it. Thank you so much. This has been such an amazing conversation. I've had such a good time. Um, we really appreciate it. Um, I want to remind everybody that next week your author is back for its um, final installment of the summer season with uh, author and illustrator Lauren Castillo, who will mm -hmm. talk about her book, Our Friend Hedgehog, The Story of Us. As always, you can watch and interact on the Los Angeles Public Library's YouTube channel or Facebook page, and we hope to see you there. Thank you so much, Danielle Clayton. Thank you. Thank you, Danielle. Thank, Thank you, everybody, everybody for being with us. Have a great weekend. Stay safe out there. Bye. <laughs>